Everybody here has disappointments. Everybody here has physical infirmities. We got, I know we've got one lady going to the hospital in the morning. I know we've had people that have had deaths in their family uh, recently. And, and I know you're bearing burdens. But God's able to enable you to keep on keeping on through the burdens. And I hope that God will use this passage and God will use this message to stir you and me to serve God together in days to come. If you have Romans 12, would you mind standing with me please for the reading of the scripture and reverence for the Word of God. Here at Glenwood Baptist Church, when we say the Word of God, we're talking about the book that's in my hand. Commonly referred to as the King James Version. This is a King James 1611 authorized version Bible. This is God's infallible, inerrant, and inspired Word. This is the pure, perfect, and preserved Word of God. As a matter of fact, if it ain't King James, it ain't Bible at all. It's just one of the devil's counterfeits. You say, well, preacher, what do I do? I've got one of those other different Bible versions. Well, I suggest you just listen. Just listen. We'll be preaching from this one. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth, with diligence. He that showeth mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now, let me say that I believe that one shows the other. You don't really love the good like you should unless you hate the evil Amen. like you should. Amen. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Verse 11 will be our text verse. It runs well in line with verse 1, which closes with these words of reasonable service. But verse 11 says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Let's bow our heads and hearts together for prayer and ask God's blessings on the message. Heavenly Father, we're very thankful for your blessings upon each one of us. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would work in the preaching of the Word of God now. Help us to give you our undivided attention. And I pray that if there's anyone in our midst who is not serving God because they've never truly been born again, that the Holy Spirit would show them that and that the first step to being able to serve God is to be saved, to be a child of God. And I do pray for uh, the children of God here that we'd all be encouraged to serve you until you call us home. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Won't you be seated? In the message, I'm going to talk a lot about serving God. And I'll try to remember that we may have people in this congregation who think about serving God, but yet you're not even saved. It, it frightens me to think of how many Baptists may be on the Baptist roll, but are not on heaven's roll. 
And it's one thing to get people to think that you're saved. It's another thing to be saved and know it. So I pray again, the Holy Spirit will help you if you're not saved to come clean with God before we leave here today and get that thing settled. But for all of you that are saved, God saves you to serve. God didn't save you to just sit. God saved you to serve. God saved you so that you could glorify Him while you're on this earth. If God saved you just so that you could go to heaven, do you know how that could have been fulfilled? Just kill your dead as a hammer just as soon as you got saved. <coughs> if that's all that God wanted was for you to go to heaven, He could have saved you and then boom, knocked you dead just as soon as you got saved because you would definitely be heaven bound. Yeah. God, I wonder how many people we've got here that's been saved more than five years. Do you hold your hands if you've been saved more than five years? All right, God has allowed you to be saved for at least five years or more. Some of us, many years. Yeah. Now, for a reason. That's right. And He could have taken you home, but He allowed you to stay. You know why? God has allowed you to stay on this earth after you've been saved because He wants you to glorify Him before men. Amen. Everything that we do after we get saved should be in gratitude for the fact we have been saved. And let's go out there and do what God would have us to do. Let's glorify Him uh, with our lives. And that's what this message is going to be about uh, today. And I'm going to title the message just a very simple uh, desire that I have for you and me. The title of the message is, Let's Serve God Together. Amen. Let's Serve God Together. Now it is true that in serving God, we can serve one another in, in doing things for each other in His name. Uh, by the way, that's what the word minister means. A minister over a church is an overseer of the congregation. He's not a lord over the flock, but he is. He does take the oversight of the flock. But the way he serves the, or oversees the flock is by serving the flock. He serves God in serving them. And his life should be given uh, for that purpose. But every last one of us is a servant of God when you get saved. In that sense, each of you is a minister. You may not be a minister in the sense that God's called you to pastor a church or go to the mission field or anything like that, but God's called you to serve Him. And that's what a ministry is. Ministry is nothing more than service to God. And by serving God, we serve people getting the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ out to where people are. Everybody here should be ministering. Everybody here should be serving God. When you go, when you leave here and you go to the house, you ought to serve God along the way. Amen. If you get pulled over by the policeman, you ought to serve God. If you uh, go to a service station, you ought to serve God. That's why I encourage people to carry gospel tracts with them. Because even giving somebody a gospel tract is just one little measure of service. But let me say that that there is a prerequisite to serving God. And say, okay, preacher, I'd like to serve God. What do I got to do? Well, before you can serve God, there's a prerequisite to serving God, and that is salvation. Amen. People get the two confused. A lot of people think that by serving God, they're going to be saved. Yeah. Those people are lost. Amen. Yeah. So if you're thinking that one of these days you're going to do this and that, you're going to be a better person and all that, and you'll get to go to heaven, you're lost. Right. Yeah. Because a person who is saved is not saved. Let me give you the verse. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you um, three verses that deal with both subjects. And if you're not acquainted with these three verses, I would encourage you to get acquainted with them. I'm talking about Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. Ephesians 2. You can turn there if you want to. I'm not going to give you a lot of time. But Ephesians chapter 2 says in verse 8, For by grace are you saved. Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the yes. gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. That's salvation. Yes. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. The Christian walk is a walk of faith, but it is uh, walking in 
serving God and doing the good works by faith, doing the good works that God wants us to do. But the first thing is in verses 8 and 9 is salvation by grace through faith, not of works. Everybody in this building, or whoever might be listening to this by the means, everybody in this building that is saved is saved by not one work you've done ever. Amen. You're saved by not any work you've ever promised to do ever. You are saved by works, but not your work. You're Amen. saved by His work on the cross of Calvary. Amen. You're saved by the blood that was shed on the cross for you. You're saved by His atonement uh, that the Lord made for you when He died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You cannot serve God until you get that straightened out. As long as you associate you getting saved with getting in these baptism waters, you'll never be able to serve God because you're not saved yet. As long as you associate your salvation with anything other than Jesus Christ and what He did for you on the cross and you trusting Him. And that's all. There's not a thing you can do. All you can do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That word believe is, equa is equated in the Bible with faith. For by grace you're saved through faith. faith. It's equated with trusting in whom also you trusted in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm saying it simply. And I try to be as simple as I can. You're saved, then you serve. Amen. Okay? Yeah. I don't, I'm, if you're not saved, I'm not the least bit interested yeah. in you joining our church. Yeah. If you're not saved, I'm not the least bit interested in you putting money in the offering plate. Amen. If you're not saved, I'm not the least bit interested in you getting baptized, joining the church, surrendering to the mission field, or anything else. If you're not saved, I have one interest for you. The members of this church who know the Lord, they have one interest for you. And that is that you be saved and know that you're going to heaven. Amen. You're saved, then you serve. As soon as you get saved, I think you ought to come down this aisle and make it known. Amen. Take a public stand for Jesus. As soon as you get saved, I believe you ought to get in the baptistry. As soon as you get saved, I believe everybody in Jacksonville ought to join Glenwood Baptist Church. As soon as you get saved, start reading your Bible and start praying and, and those things. But that service, the prerequisite of service is salvation. Simply put, you know, let's serve God together. Do you know Amen. for sure you're saved? Amen. Hey, if you're saved, you may not be the best Christian in the world, but you're, if you're saved, let's serve God again. Amen. Second thing I want to mention to you is the priority of service. The priority of service. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, for you single people are people that are wondering about Polygamy versus monogamy. That's the verse I use to prove to people that no man should have two wives. No man can serve two masters. You can think about that for a while. Jesus answered the devil at his temptation in the wilderness, saying, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Our service, when we serve one another, should be done only as service unto the Lord. Yeah. You're serving uh, other people only to serve God and do it for the honor and glory of God. Galatians 5.13 says, By love, serve one another. And folks, service uh, may seem like demeaning, but the, the happiest Christians are not the ones who are always wanting to be recognized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The happiest Christians are not the ones who are always wanting to call the shots at a business meeting mm -hmm. or to have a position where they are known in the church as being this or that. The happiest Christians are those who are serving. Amen. I'm telling you, yeah. the happiest Christians are the ones who are thinking about others. What can I do to help that person as a Christian or help that person to be saved. Here's a good acronym for you. Some of you know this. And the acronym is JOY. Have you got JOY? I think I sent a note out to a bunch of people this morning about that the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Uh, if you're not joyful in the Lord, you're wimpy. You are, you're caving in if you don't have joy in the Lord. A bitter Christian uh, not only defiles others, but he defiles himself. And you lose your own ability to be able to carry the, even the lightest burden for the Lord. I'm saying, get your joy. Here's one way you can do it. Write down this acronym, J-O-Y. It has to do with service. J-O-Y. You, some of you know where I'm going. Jesus first. Others next. You last. Okay, that's the way to get joy is Jesus first, others next, and you last. I'm saying the priority of service is number one, serve God. And then if you want to be happy, serve others in His name. And then serve yourself last. Third thing I want to mention is the picture of service. And the picture of service as we serve God together is Jesus Christ Himself. Jesus Christ said that the Son of Man didn't come into this world to be ministered to. But He came into this world to minister. I believe that a preacher, again, I believe that a preacher ought to be the overseer of a church. The Bible says that in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. But I believe that every preacher ought to be willing to clean the toilets in the church. I believe every preacher ought to be willing to cut the grass. I believe every last one of us ought to be willing to do the most menial tasks Amen. in the church. You know, one of my greatest feelings of accomplishment in the last few weeks is, is getting some light bulb fixtures clean. That's right. Just here lately. And, uh, and a preacher doesn't have to do that. Somebody else ought to do that if can. But a preacher ought to be willing to do that. That's right. And if you want to be happy in the Lord, just go ahead and, and I'm telling you, you'll get joy out of it. Right. Preacher, what do, you, what do you do with all your off time, your full time preaching? Well, one thing I did this week is day before yesterday, I went and cut an old man's hair. Yeah, next week I'm going to go cut his other one. <laughs> you tell him I said that. So it's a neighbor of one of our members. His kidneys have stopped on him. Don't know how long he's going to be around. He got saved uh, here in this town at an independent Baptist church just up the road. And the uh, pastor there's I think he's dead now. But, uh, but he knows he's saved. And he probably doesn't have too much time left. But somebody got word out that I could cut hair. And so, uh, and so I went and cut. You know what? It was a joy to him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see this man in glory. If he's, if he's really saved, I'm going to see him in glory. Amen. And uh, if he doesn't last very long, it would be a blessing in my heart that I got to serve him in the name of the Lord. Amen. I believe people have done things to me, blessing me in the name of the Lord. And I believe the Lord's going to reward them for it. I don't believe the Lord rewards you just for doing something for somebody else. But if you do it in the name of the Lord, Amen. I believe the Lord's going to reward you. Amen. And so when we serve God together, you need to keep in mind the prerequisite of the service to be saved. The priority of service is put God first and always do what you do for Him. The third picture, the third part of the picture of service is Jesus. He said, I am among you as he that serveth. In Luke chapter 22, verse 27. Now, there were people that did things for our Lord. Do you remember the breaking of the alabaster box and the wiping of His feet with tears and all that? There were people who did things. To, but primarily, Jesus walked among men, suffering to serve mankind and to die for all men and shed His blood that they might be saved. I, if you still have your Bibles there, I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And I want you to notice here something about the presentation of service. The presentation of service. And I would like to encourage you to think about obeying what Paul says in verse 1. This is God's Word, written by inspiration through the Lord's tool instrument, the Apostle Paul. Romans 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, 
which is your reasonable service. Verse 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's the, here's the presentation of service. First of all, it's sensible. It's reasonable. To present our bodies as a living sacrifice is said to be your reasonable service. What makes it reasonable? What makes it reasonable is, is that Jesus Christ paid for our eternal life with His own blood on the cross of Calvary. Amen. It just makes sense that we show some gratitude. It just makes sense. For somebody to love us so much when we were unlovely. To somebody, for God to love us when we were so ungodly. For the Holy One to love us when we were so unholy. It makes sense that you and I who are saved serve the Lord. Serve Him sensibly. I'd say serve Him submissively, believing that it is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, submit uh, and do it uh, sacrificially, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And then that is your reasonable service. How is it to be done? It's not to be done because somebody talked you into it. It's to be done because you willingly did it as unto the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. I'd love to see some more people sing in the choir. I'd love to see somebody volunteer to train to learn to play this musical instrument. Amen. I'd like to see somebody volunteer. Uh, I'm not talking about somebody that already knows how. I'd like to see somebody volunteer to train to learn how to play this musical instrument right here. To lead the singing, to teach Sunday school class, to be a preacher someday. And God will not draft you apart from your willingness to present yourselves. The picture of it in the Old Testament setting is in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah said, And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me. It's a choice you make. Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15, he said to the Israelites, Choose you this day. Whom ye will serve. And in so many words he says, I've already made my choice. He says, you choose. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's serve God together. I wonder if somebody who's saved, well during this invitation time, would get yourself back right with God just as much as you can. And join this church. And serve God with the rest of us. That's what God wants you to do. Don't put it off. Do it right now. Maybe you haven't been serving God in a while like you used to. I'd like you to, to encourage you. Come back to it. Come back to it. There's no doubt. Just, just dip, dip your toe into the water and, uh, and see what God might do. You know what? You might find out that it's pretty nice to swim around in here with the rest of us folks <laughs> from Glenwood Baptist Church. It's not as cold as you thought it would be. You thought you'd freeze yourself to death. I'd encourage you just to jump on in. Would you stand with me, please? Heads bowed for prayer. We'll give an invitation.